Wine TV. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host Mark Fusco here for another edition of the show. All right, so it's been a couple weeks, haven't had a show out. Um, scheduling, went to uh, the, went to the uh, Hill Country for a wine writer's workshop, went to Houston for a Napa Valley Masterclass. Give you a quick rundown on those things. So the wine writer's workshop, you know, it was a cool little trip. We visited uh, five wineries and a distillery called Garrison Brothers, um, Texas Bourbon, um, really good, um, not cheap. I think it was around 80 bucks for their blended and like a hundred or something for their single barrel. Both were excellent. Um, if you didn't know that you can make good bourbon outside of Kentucky, um, or that bourbon could be made out of outside of Kentucky, it can, and um, it's pretty decent. So, uh, and I'm not a bourbon aficionado. So, you know, all I can tell you is it tasted really good. Of course, we taste at the end of a great tour, so you're already in a good good mood and you're already built up with how great this bourbon is going to be anyway. But it was good. So, I mean, all all kidding aside and all like hype aside, it's good. I actually asked uh, uh, the gentleman at the end if I could come back sometime and do uh, put him on the show. So we'll see if that happens, you know, between my schedule and his schedule, um, if we're able to do that. My plan was to sometime in May do that, but um, my plans in May with this month uh, might be changing. So I might be taking a trip out of the state and uh, like 99% sure going to Jersey. So yes, Carl, I will contact you uh, <laughs> if I come up. Anyway, um, so... Uh, there's, there's a very, very small chance that it won't go to Jersey, but for the most part, we're probably going up there. Anyway, um, so the actual workshop, well, I mean, we had two panels, a panel on Texas wine. That was interesting. There's, you know, I, I don't know everything about Texas wine. I don't specialize in it. I do try to follow the industry as much as I can. Um, you know, I do get quite a bit of uh, newsletter stuff, and you know, I try to read the couple blogs that, that specialize in Texas wines. Um, when, when I'm able to, but uh, so there was some interesting stuff, and of the four panel people, I knew one really well, and then one I've a couple of them I've met occasionally, um, or have have seen each other, and then the, the fourth one I don't think I'd ever met or even knew about, and actually he hung out with us on some of the wine things, and he was cool to get get uh, to get to know. So um, the other panel was about content, and um, I, I didn't really get much out of it other than the four people worked for a convention bureau um, and what they do for their areas and that they're available for content um, if you're writing about wine. So, um, I mean, it wasn't a wasn't bad. It just, for what I do, it's not, wasn't more geared towards what I do here on, on the show. So, um, we also took a tour of Boot Ranch. Boot Ranch is way out of my price range. Um, but if you've got a lot of money and you want a family oriented country club place that you can live, um, in, in, you know, close enough to a large town, but out in the middle of nowhere, um, it's great. <laughs> I, I, um, the, the two dinners we had were amazing dinners. Granted there, there were specific dinners that were, um, were wine dinners. So this is not necessarily their normal, um, their normal dinner fair, but I mean, really creative with what they did. Uh, the chef was uh, pretty cool, came out and talked to us. The wines were from Becker and from uh, Messina Hoff. Kudos to both wineries, to the wines that they, they paired up with us. Um, and it was great to see uh, uh, Dr. and Bunny Becker. It also was great to see uh, Paul and Karen uh, Bonarigo uh, from Messina Hoff. So, um, Sorry I didn't make it out there on my way back from Houston, but I had to get back in town quickly. 
um, for some work stuff. Anyway, um, so that was a good trip. I stayed in this cool bed and breakfast called Valentine Hill. It's literally like a mile and a half from Boot Ranch in the middle of nowhere. I was the only person of the three cabins, you know, only cabin being used. It's the middle of the week. I'm sure it's pretty empty most of the time. Um, reasonable rates. Um, it is basically a one room log cabin, you know, with, with a bathroom. Um, Wi-Fi wasn't that good. Uh, there was no dresser to speak of um, and nowhere to hang clothes. But other than that, I mean, if I had to be nitpicky, that's being nitpicky. I mean, if you're being out, if you kind of want to be a little isolated, who really cares about the Wi-Fi? I just needed to check email. But when I was like doing speed checks, I was like, I just used my phone connection and it was slightly faster because it's cell service wasn't the best out there either. But it was better than whatever Wi-Fi we had. My feeling is they had satellite Wi-Fi because Boot Ranch says that they have satellite Wi-Fi. And the, the, this place is literally like, I don't know, the entrance to where I was at to the entrance to Boot Ranch is probably not even half a mile. So um, the actual driving was almost two miles to get from my cabin to the, to the country club uh, itself. But um, anyway, so it was probably satellite. I might, that's my guess. So... Um, people tell me that satellite's getting better and faster. Well, I didn't notice it. Uh, anyway, um, also depends on what plan they have. But I mean, if you want like a little bit of isolation, but close enough to town to like drive in to get some, you know, get some supplies or go have dinner, um, it's cool. It is kind of on the other side of Fredericksburg, away from most of the wineries. Well, Fredericksburg is actually away from most of the wineries. It's still like a 15-minute drive to like the first group of them. But um, it's a nice isolated place. I would recommend it. I wouldn't even mind staying there again uh, for like just like a getaway. Um, the master class in Houston was at Papa's Brothers. And um, kudos to them again. Uh, I know quite a few of the people out over there and it was great to see them. Uh, great to see some of the other people in the Houston area that came out to the master class uh, about Napa. Matt Stamp did an amazing presentation. I think this is the first time I've ever met him and ever seen him do a presentation. I've heard him on the podcast quite a few times. They have a guild psalm, sorry, the Guild of Sommeliers it was who presented this or, uh, yeah, who presented the class. And they have a podcast, an audio podcast. If you're in the industry, you should listen to that podcast. They're not super frequent, but when they are, when they produce a show, it's good stuff. The other podcast, I can't say good enough good things about this podcast. I'll drink to that Levy Dalton he has an amazing podcast of interviews, interviews like everybody in the world, in the, in the wine world and a couple times like outside of the wine world, but listening to him for the past, what, seven months now, um, and all the people that were associated with Napa during that time, uh, cause it's not just Napa, but he does see a lot of Napa people, um, hearing their history and then what Matt did, his history and just everything just melded put you know he, matt basically connected all the dots um so it was it was really cool so if you're in the industry for sure you should be listening to it because it gives you the background of a lot of people if you didn't already know about them especially when you talk about european winemakers um that maybe we don't know or at least i don't know i mean they're all new to me but um it's, it's some great stuff so um but anyway houston was great had a great wine dinner later on that night at papa's um through a, through a friend of you know, friend of a friend, um, we had, uh, and if you, if you follow my tweets and Facebook posts and Instagram, you probably saw the pictures of the uh, 1962 Vegas Cecilia Unico. Um, it's basically drinking like a port. It's a Tempranillo. It was pretty amazing and something that I would never have access to um, or personally be able to afford. And then we had a couple other uh, really good wines. Had a really good uh, Burgundy and. Uh, uh, champagne, which I don't remember the name of that, but um, it was a great time and um, can't wait to go back to Houston to have a good time again. All right, so let's get into the wines um, real quick. So these are two wines that um, I've had in my little uh, rack for a while and it's like, yeah, yeah, I'll get to that, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. So then when I was doing the last set of shows, I was gonna review these wines and I was like, I really don't know where I got them from. Um, well, one of them specifically, one I know where I got it from. The other one, I had no idea where I got it from. And I don't like, well, I don't like putting wines in the show I can't at least tell you how I got it because I'm supposed to be able to tell you how I got it, whether it was even a gift or for free. 
it, there's like this federal obligation that you reveal how you get your products. Like I bought the Coravin, it wasn't supplied to me. So um, I love this thing. Anyway, um, so the first wine we're gonna do, um, let's just get right into it. The first wine is Greedy. Greedy Cabernet Sauvignon Alexander Valley 2011. Now, this is the one I couldn't remember how I got. Now, I bought this, uh, I forgot how long ago, but I bought this quite a while ago through Underground Cellar. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, I'm, not doing, I'm not doing a, a Wall Street Journal wine for once. Um, actually, I think I have one more Wall Street Journal wine, and then I have a wine a friend gave me, which I don't know, they're, they're sitting over here. I, I'm recording at least two episodes. I don't know if I'm recording the third, but we'll get to that later. All right, so Greedy Wines. Now, here's the funny part about this. Well, 32 bucks uh, with the Underground Cellar. This was the cheapest of the wines. Uh, it was a Cabernet. It was a Cabernet deal. Um, this was the the entry level price or the entry price. Um, so thirty two bucks, and this is what it's available for. So this is the funny part. So it's actually G Reedy, not Greedy. G dot Reedy, and actually I think I think there's a small yeah there's a small. Like small little dot. New specs, by the way, progressives. I'm actually loving them. It took me like three, four hours to kind of get over that disorientation, almost nausea feeling um, yesterday, but um, I'm loving them now. Uh, and hopefully, I got the anti glare like my friend Jack said to do. So I'm assuming the lights aren't reflecting off the glasses. I'll find out when I edit. Um, but anyway, so it's G dot ready. So the G is the first name of uh, Reedy, not ready. Uh, the first name of one guy, and Reedy is the last name of the other guy. I'll tell you, it's Ross Reedy, and the G is Greg Ermini. You remember who Greg Ermini is? Yes, that is the guy that is the cross barn winemaker. So how did I know? I mean, I had no idea, Greg, if you're watching this uh, at all, that I actually have one of your wines, and I bought it before I even met you. Talk about small world coincidences, all this kind of stuff. So who are they? Uh, so these two guys, uh, Greg and Ross, um, were studying abroad in Florence. If you remember, we, uh, Greg told us he was in Florence for a while studying. And these two guys met up, and they basically uh, decided they were uh, com uh, not compatible. That sounds kind of weird. Um, but that they had this love for wine, and they decided that they were going to create a wine, and they called it G. Reedy or Greedy. Um, I, I I don't know if if it's supposed to be pronounced greedy or not, but it's but uh, when you look see it in print, they well they do have greedy without the dot on a couple of places. So anyway, um, so they're you know a small production wine wine uh, wine producers. Uh, so obviously a side project for Greg. Um, I really don't know what Ross does. Um, I'll be honest. I don't know if he's also a winemaker somewhere else. I didn't look him up. But uh, let's get oh Alexander Valley. So let's get into the wine. So um, at my day job, or literally the night job, we just got this. And um, I'm really excited about it because it's some cool stuff. I already did the thing. Um, some cool stuff to do this. So if you're from work, this is how you use it if you didn't pay attention. A uh, little initial thing, a little bit of water left from cleaning the, uh, from cleaning the needle. That should be enough. All right, put this back here. All right, so. Yeah, I didn't have the. It always looks so dark in here now. So I've got those covers on the lights and they dim everything, but it gives you a much more even lighting. I, I, and when I look at my, my video, it doesn't look like it's too bad, doesn't look too dark and all that, but it feels dark. And I feel like I want to get the next level up on lights, but that's another $100 I'd have to spend on that. You could always hit the PayPal button, send me 100 bucks, or collectively send me 100 bucks. See how I got that PayPal reference in before the end of the show? All right, so, um, you know, not a deep, deep, dark red. Now, granted, I only have a little bit of wine in there, but it is kind of see-through, so I'm a little bit surprised on that with the cab, but it doesn't mean it's bad, just maybe it just didn't have as much extraction. 
but it's got you know some it's got some pretty cool color it looks almost i want to say cloudy but um i mean i can see through my hand fine but when we look at that you see like a lot of diffusion at the very edge so it's a very even diffusion as far as the water so on the nose A little bit, not, I want to say brambly, but a little, a little brambly, a little bit of wood you can smell. Um, red fruit, cream, vanilla. Too bad the glasses don't make me smell better. Or have the ability to smell better. I always smell great. Well, maybe not. <laughs> You know, I do miss I do miss wearing cologne because you can't wear cologne and evaluate wine anymore. So yeah, I mean I would say red fruits, maybe some raspberry, kind of a creaminess, vanilla. The wood isn't so prominent anymore. But yeah, like a almost like a cherry smell too. So cherry pie. So that's that cream and cherry and fruit and all that good stuff. Yeah, all the other, I kind of bled over a little bit too long on that. Ooh, and now I'm getting a little bit of pepper. A little bit of pepper. It's opening up some more. So let's try it out. Hmm. This is good. Like, it's not because I met Greg. If I told, if I didn't like it, I'd say, hey man, Greg, I don't really like it. Stick with the cross barn. But this is really good. It's really tasty. Um, it's got all those components I just talked about. And it's just kind of layered. It's just, it's, there's like a layer effect. You get a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it kind of comes in and comes out. It's, it's, I don't want to say that it's not balanced, okay? Because it's balanced in the sense that the, the, there's not too hot, it's not too tannic, um, it's not any one flavor. But it's kind of like when you, I know I use music a decent amount, but it's like when you listen to, to a song and sometimes, you know, the, the, the drums come through a little bit for a while and sometimes the singer's coming through a little bit, sometimes the piano or the guitar or the sax or whatever. So it's, it's like... You get all the, all the flavors are there, and all of a sudden, one flavor goes, hey, and then it comes back down. The other flavor goes, hey. Hmm. This is the one I want to swallow. I mean, this is the one I want to drink. This is the one you could drink. I feel like I almost drink it on its own. With food, it'd be better. But man, I'm telling you, it's got, now it doesn't have as much cream as, as, as on the flavor as I got on the nose, but it's, the fruit is fresh and bright and it, you know, we're talking four years now or almost four years, not really three years. Um, it's fresh, it's bright, um, it's, it's bright red fruit. Um, you got a hint of pepper and not necessarily green pepper, but maybe a little white and black pepper in there. Um, the wood isn't so prominent, but you can tell there's a little bit of wood, you know, a little wood flavor to it. The vanilla's there. Um, it's, it's light. Um, I would say this is a medium minus bodied wine. The tannins are there. They're medium minus. This is not a heavily tannic wine. Um, you know, I know in Napa specifically, 2011 was a very challenging, <clears throat> challenging year. I don't really know so much on the Sonoma side. Um, because I don't deal with a lot of Sonoma wines versus Napa, or it's not talked about as much as far as 2011. Um, but, you know, this is a lighter style Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, there's some pepper right there, that little, that little bit. Um, I don't know if, if the weather was exactly the same, if it rained a lot near the end of, end of the season for, you know, when they got, when they got the harvest. Because that was the big thing. It was a long growing season. It rained near harvest time so it it 
hurt the grapes. But, you know, if you're a good winemaker, like we heard all my through my trip at Napa, it didn't really matter. Well, it's not that it didn't matter. It's just that it presented a different challenge, but it didn't matter that you couldn't make a good wine. You can make a good wine. So I highly recommend if you can find this wine somewhere, if you've seen an underground seller for $32, it's a good value for that. It's not priced too terribly high. It's not priced too low. I mean, obviously for value, if you could find it for like five to 10 bucks less, I think it'd be even better because I think you'd feel you got an even better deal out of it. But $32 is not a, it's not a terrible amount of money to spend on this particular bottle of wine. And again, it has nothing to do with the fact that I interviewed the winemaker for a different project. If I thought it was overpriced, or if I thought it was priced incorrectly, I would say so. I wouldn't tell you to buy it. If you've got $32, um, which is you know the kind of higher end of what I try to review on the show, um, and you want something that's a good bottle of wine that doesn't necessarily have to be a special night, but something that that maybe is not your ordinary like hey ten dollar bottle of wine night, this would be good, especially for a lighter fare. I think it's great. All right, so let's move on to wine number dose. And you know what? I don't even need to take that out because <clears throat> well, curtains should have already happened. Wine number two. The Yangara, let's uh, close out these little windows here. The Yangara Estate Vineyard McLaren Vale 2011 Shiraz. That's because this wine, uh-oh, this wine's open. Well, this may be a really short show. <laughs> this wine was already open. So how did I get the wine? I got the wine at Texom last year. Okay, someone gave it to me, I don't remember who, but it was a free wine. Um, before we even taste it, let's just kind of go through how much it is. If you go to the website, it's 25 bucks for the bottle from the website. Uh, and that's for the 2012 vintage. So um, I, I, I've seen the name around, so we'll take a chance, but I have a feeling this is gonna be nasty wine. And not because the wine was made poorly, it's just that it's been open all this time and it hasn't been sitting in the wine cooler the whole time either. It's been sitting in like the house and the temperature differences. So I know Stelvin enclosures are great, but they're not, but once they're open, they have, they are open. So, oh yeah. Doesn't smell bad. We might be getting lucky here. I don't know how we're going to get lucky on this, but we'll see. I mean, doesn't smell bad also means I don't really smell a whole lot, but if there's, there's is a, um, there is an earthiness to it and it's starting to open up. There's an earthiness to it. Like dirt, like, like, you know, wet leaves, you know, like forest floor, like wet forest floor. Or maybe mushroom. I mean, it's very earthy. There's not a lot of fruit coming through and not a lot of wood coming through. It is, you know, it almost smells a little bit musty and dusty. Now, typically in wine, that's a good thing, right? Let's find out. First, right off the bat, it's not vinegar. Um, I've had wine that's been open for too long. It doesn't taste like that. Okay. I'm gonna look at their tasting notes because it says 2000, let's look at the 2011 tasting notes. Does, it just tells you about the vintage or something. So the 2011 tasting notes say, 
The wine has a heady illusion of sweetness and confection. After that, lovely slender of syrup establishes itself. Oozes of prune, blackberry, antwine, dark chicory, juniper tannins, harness leather. Primary fruit and vegetation. Prickle like some of the... the According to them, there's a fruit. It's like a fruit bomb. At least the 12 is. Let's the jury's out for me on this. Because while I said it's not vinegar, I think it has turned. I think it's been... I think that, that the enclosure has has had a uh, done an admirable job of trying to preserve the wine even though it's been open but it felt like it was still it felt like the cap was still kind of loose um, but it was a full bottle so I don't know I mean it doesn't taste bad it tastes okay but it doesn't taste bad um, I don't get a fruit bomb out of it I taste this wine very similar wines that taste like this all the time but my but, but I suspect that it's, it's been affected by oxygen. Maybe it's just like aged faster because it's been sitting there. Now, granted, it's sat in a cooler at 55 degrees for the past five months now, or four months. So that might have helped preserve it a little bit. But my feeling is what I'm tasting right now is not the wine that was supposed to have been, been there when I got it back in August. That sucks because I was looking forward. I mean, I'm not, it's not a bad wine, but I don't think this is the wine that I was... I don't think this is the, the, the wine that it was back in August. So um, I think I'd rather try it again and see... Is it a $25 wine? Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's still drinkable. I mean, it's got, let's just go through it. Let's just evaluate what it has right now. Maybe this is the right flavor profile. I guess what it is, I'm doubting it. <clears throat> it's kind of sharp, um, angly. Um, it's got a bit of tartness, a bit of acidity to it. Um, just red fruits. I don't get any of the other stuff they're talking about. Um, I guess they said prickliness. Um, I guess you know, that's the acid, I'm sure. Um, and maybe there's a bit of woodsiness to it. But as far as like, do I get any particular fruit? Mm. They say prune. I just say generic red fruit. Um, it could be almost almost sour type of sour cherry. That's why I think it has turned a little bit. So anyway, um, who are they? I forgot to tell you who they are because I was more concerned about the fact that when I opened it, I was concerned it was going to be like vinegar. Um, so this particular estate was... was um, Established in 19 or planting a vineyard started in 1946. The property was called Lala Rook or Ruka, uh, called Love Nest. This is in Australia, by the way, if you didn't know where McLaren Vale is, um, or Vale, I'm sorry, not Vale. Um, so, uh, Bernard Smart and his wife, uh, assisted his father in the High Sands Vineyard, uh, to, to, to plant unirrigated bush vine Grenache. Uh, they planted another vineyard in uh, 1947, um, but that was uh, killed by drifting sand. So uh, I'm going to say the High Sands Vineyard probably is very sandy. So, mm. excuse me. So since 1946, the, the, it's been around. In 2000, Jess Jackson, yes, uh, Kendall Jackson, and his wife Barbara Bank, or is it Banky? I think it's Banky. Um, they came down and they eventually bought the estate. Um, so Jess Jackson, if you didn't know, Jackson Family Wines is more than just Kendall Jackson. They, they've got wine interests all over the world and they have some pretty high-end wines in, in at least Napa Valley and, and I'm sure a few other places. Um, 
couple of the wines that they have that are very high end that you may not realize are Cardinal and La Coya, which are fantastic wines and they're outside of my price range. But so uh, they, they do, they make a lot of wine, um, a lot of quality wine, and they also make a lot of ordinary wine, right? Value wine. Anyway, you know what? <clears throat> I'm going to say it's okay. Um, I can't give a recommendation or not because I don't, like I said, I don't think I'm tasting the, the wine that was in that bottle. I don't think the wine is how it is now is how it should be um, with a perfectly sealed capsule. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Um, as always, click me, uh, click the links above to friend me up. Click the links below for more information. Hit the PayPal button over there. Send me a few ducats. And we'll see everyone again next time.